right. Well, the truth of the matter is that there's a little bit of referee in each one of us. And a referee is supposed to call penalties, to watch closely, when, see, see when things aren't going well. And in the Church of Colossae, people had kind of gotten into this, into this referee, uh, umpire kind of a mode. And, and really, when it comes to sports, you need it. But when it comes to faith, it can be a problem. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about some of the ways that we can kind of turn into referees that might be a little bit of a problem. So you're watching somebody very spiritually because you're very mature in your Christian faith, and you see them doing something that you think is wrong, so what do you do? You pull out the flag, you throw it. All right? You blow the whistle, and you give the signal. There's this one. There's this one. Anybody know what that is? No, no, you're thinking, no, 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 I'm talking about spiritual. This, 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 this penalty, when you do that, you look at somebody and you do this, it says, you're being overly spiritual. You know? Woo! Praise the Lord. You know, you're, you're, you're watch someone, and they're, you know, they're, woo, they're worshiping, and you're like, you're, you're, you're just kind of, you're, you don't go in their face, but you're thinking to yourself, you're judging in your own heart, oh, don't think, don't they think they're spiritual? Look at they, not just, no, not just one hand, two hands. <laughs> wow, they're overdoing it, right? Or maybe you throw the flag and you blow the whistle, but it is this, it, this is the penalty you call. You know what that is? Unspiritual. Thank you, Dennis. Yeah, yeah. You call the penalty. Oh, oh, you don't even lift your hands. You don't even, you don't even move a little bit to the music. You just, you just stand there. So you, you call the penalty. Oh, they're not spiritual enough. There's, there's all kinds of penalties we can, we can call. You watch somebody, and you've grown up in a certain tradition, a certain spiritual Christian tradition. You watch them, and you see them doing something that, that you know they shouldn't be doing. You throw the flag. You blow the whistle. You call the penalty. Here's the penalty. Watch close now. Here's the penalty. You know what that penalty is? What's that? Whining, kind of. It's, oh, in a way, overindulgence. You can't drink wine. Christians don't drink wine, and you call the penalty. You, you throw the flag. You call the penalty because you know it's ungodly for any, for, for any alcohol to touch anybody's lips. I mean, you know that. You were taught that growing up. The Bible must say it because that's what your pastor said when you were, and so you, you throw the flag. You call the penalty. I got one more. I got one more. You throw the flag, you blow the whistle, and you call the penalty. Here it is. Watch. Here's the penalty. Don't eat that. You don't need it. Okay? And, and you look at another person, and you decide what they should be eating. You say, well, that's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. But I'm going to tell you right now, this is exactly what was happening in the church in the first century. And it still happens in the church today. And so, here's what I want you to look up on the screens here. I've got three questions for you. And we're going to actually, it's going to be crazy, you're going to, during church, you're going to talk to each other. I know, I know. You're going to throw the flag. We don't do that, no. Don't blow the whistle on me here. So here's, I want you to get in groups of like three or four or five people. And for about two minutes, here's the questions. What are some of the rules we impose on Christians that are not really God's rules, that what you can or what you can't? You know, Christian can't do that. Christian can't do that. What are the rules that, that you have watched be imposed, but they're not God's rules, they're our rules? Second question, what are ways we throw a flag or blow a whistle on each other in a judgmental way? You're, it's going to be unlikely that someone's going to actually throw a flag on you or blow a whistle, but there's ways we treat each other when we know that we're more spiritual than they are because they don't know how to behave like we behave, like a good Christian. So what are ways that we kind of blow the whistle or throw the flag? And then third question, what are some ways Christians can place wrong judgments or thoughts on, on, on their own thoughts, words, actions, or inactions? And I think one of the people that we throw the flag on the most is ourselves. And when God may, may not be condemning or judging, we begin to judge ourselves. So you have about two to three minutes. Get in groups. Look on the screen. Pick one of those and just have an honest conversation. Ready, set, go. Talk to each other. It's allowed. Do it.
Take, it, take about 30 seconds more. All right. Let's start pulling back together. And open your Bibles to Colossians chapter 2. If you have your Bible, open it to Colossians chapter 2. How many of you, how many of you would say you grew up in some kind of church tradition where there was some kind of rules and regulations that later on you figured out, that's not in the Bible, that was just the way we did it. Anybody experienced some of that? Quite a few of you, yeah. How many of you right now know that if I was in some churches, I'd be in trouble right now as a preacher? Because, because you know why? I'm wearing jeans. And that's wicked. That's wicked, right? And I'm not wearing a tie. Thank you. I'm getting, I'm getting, oh, there, there, that, he, I just got a call. Whistle and tie. <laughs> Doug was giving me the signal. Tie. So, so let's, not, let's not start like cornering each other and you know, blowing the whistle. And make, the, the whole point of this, and, and as I worked on this passage, I need to tell you, this is probably, this could be one of those complex passages in all of the Apostle Paul's writing. And as I thought about this, God gave me some, and I, you, you know me as a pastor, I think about pictures and images, and you'll remember the whistle, you'll remember the flag, but you have to get what's going on here. So I actually want to look with, look with me at Colossians 2. We're going to read the whole passage. It's not going to be on the screen. I want you to listen to it or look in your own Bible. And let's bring the house lights up a little bit, just so if people have their Bibles, they can, they can read them. Um, and I got a yeah over there. So yeah, so, and if they're over 40, like I am, especially bring the lights up a little bit. Um, but I want you just to listen, listen to what's going on here. Here's what I want you to notice something's happening in this church. People are behaving a certain way, and they're treating each other a certain way, and it has to do with what we just talked about. It has to do with judgmentalism, pride. I know the right way to do it. You don't know the right way. I'm going to point this out to you. So, so notice that as I read this passage, and I think it'll start to make sense to you. This is Colossians 2, beginning of verse 16. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink. Interesting way to start the passage, right? Do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon, a celebration, or Sabbath day, how you do your religion. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, and here's the key, the reality, however, is found in Christ. He's what's real, not these human-made systems. Do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you because they're super spiritual. They're, they're very falsely humble, and they've got these experiences with the angels. They're, they're kind of above you spiritually. Such a person also goes into great detail about what they have seen. Oh, what I've experienced. Look at me. Look at me. They are puffed up with idle notions by their unspiritual mind. They appear spiritual, but they're really not very spiritual. They have lost connection with the head from whom the whole body supported and held together. Who's the head who holds the whole body together? Jesus is coming back to Christ as the center again. Uh, by, by its ligaments and sinews, grows as God causes it to grow. He holds the body of Christ together. Verse 20. Since you died with Christ to the elemental spiritual forces of this world, why, as though you still belong to the world, do you submit to its rules? You're letting all these worldly rules creep into your faith. Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. Don't, 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 don't. These rules, which have to do with things that are all destined to perish with use, are based on merely human commands and teachings. Such regulations indeed have the appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility, with their harsh treatment of the body, do all these things, but they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. Oh, there are certain behaviors that look so spiritual. And if I can act this way and behave a certain way and talk a certain way, and not do certain things, and do certain things, I'm very, very spiritual. As a matter of fact, I've become so spiritual that I can blow the whistle on you and point the finger at you and throw the flag on you and tell everybody else how they're supposed to live. There's something going on in the city of Colossae that is a problem spiritually. And the, the, and the reason that God gives us his word is because the more things stay the same, uh, I mean, the more things change, the more they stay the same. The more time passes, the more you realize that human beings are human beings. And if we're not careful in the church, we can become like this. And you say, well, but Shoreline's a really relaxed church. We're not into legalism. Oh, we can find our own ways to be legalistic. Trust me. Our, our human ability, and, and the more sometimes, the, the more we grow spiritually, the more humble we should become, not the more arrogant. Look how far I've come. Look how far I am above everybody else. 
But back then and today, these problems persist. And what, what the Apostle Paul is addressing is the issue of shadow or substance. He's saying there's certain things in, in, in our faith that are shadowy. They, they, they don't have substance. They don't have meaning. They don't have content, but they look so spiritual. And those, that's not where you want to be. But, but the substance, over and over again, is Christ. Do you know Christ? Do you love Christ? Do you walk with Christ? Because when you do, then the do's and don'ts make sense and you follow Jesus. But when all you're doing is legalism, it becomes a shadowy, hazy form of religion, but no power of Christ. That's what was happening then. That's what can happen in our lives today. So let's walk through this passage. Colossians 2, 16 and 17. This will be up on the screen now. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink, or with regard to religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, the substance, however, is found where? In Christ. There, there, there's this, this, this challenge that's going on. So here's the question. What are you pursuing? And I, and I want you to examine your own heart tonight. I want you to really look at your heart and say, where am I with my Christian faith? Whether you're a brand new Christian or a long-time Christian. I think sometimes the longer we've been a Christian, we can start to get into forms and the shape of things and forget what it's really about. We have to be careful. We have to check our hearts. So what are you pursuing? Religious routine or reality in Jesus? What, what is your faith about? Is it this religious routine, this, this thing I do? Or have I encountered the real, resurrected, living Christ? And he is changing my life. And he's shaking me down to the core of who I am. And he's leading me by my hand every day. I mean, I, I encounter Jesus. I see Jesus. I feel Jesus. I walk with Jesus. Or do I just do religion? And Paul's asking the question. Just doing religion is shadow. Walking with Jesus is substance. It's solid. It's real. Now, religious routine or reality in Jesus. In that time, the Apostle Paul says, here's what you're focusing on. Dietary laws, special celebrations, and Sabbath observance. Now, does God care about what we eat? Does he care about how we worship? Absolutely. But here's what had happened in the first century for some of these people. Their whole faith was just, just okay, do I eat the right thing? Do I not eat the wrong thing? I mean, I gotta eat the right thing. Do I follow the right festival order of things? On the Sabbath day, do I follow all the rules and regulations that we've created around Sabbath? And if I do all those things, here's the deal. I'm in the club. God's happy with me. Here's the problem. That becomes all it is. That's our faith. Satan delights when our faith is just a few observances of right and wrong. We can pat ourselves on the back and go on and live any way we want. But the substance is found in Jesus Christ. Now, let me be very clear. You read the whole Bible. The Bible, there, there are things. I'm talking about all the rules and regulations that we make up. I'm not talking about the ones that God says. Because when God says, thou shalt not, or thou shalt, we better not, and we better do, right? And that's what we're talking about. We're not talking tonight about what the, when the Bible says, live this way. We're talking about when we heap other things on ourselves and other people. And so what's happening is, the thing, and, and oftentimes what we do is we take the things that God says to do, and then we add six layers of stuff on top of them. That's what the Jews did with the Sabbath. Obey the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Do no work. And they layered hundreds of do's and don'ts on top of that general guideline. And Jesus came and said, the Sabbath was made for you. Not you for the Sabbath. It was made to set you free and give you rest. And it's turned into this taskmaster that's made you a slave. That's what, that's what religious observance does for us when Christ isn't at the heart of it. So understand, I'm not talking, if you're, go, if you're going, oh, wait a minute, he's just talking about do whatever you want. No. We follow what God's word says and we follow it as passionately and strongly as we can and we don't make, make it there all the way. We ask God to forgive us. And he gives us grace and we get up and we keep following I'm talking about all the extra stuff we add on because that's what the Apostle Paul is dealing with here. So, what might, so he's talking about empty religion. What might empty religion look like today? Now, I want to make a suggestion. I want you to notice something because these, these two things can look very similar. So, empty religion could look like this. I go to church. I go faithfully all the time, which means at least once or twice a month in our world today, right? Okay, but, but I mean, I, I go to church. And I may, not, you know, I may not enjoy it, I may not like it, it may be a hassle, but I do it, because I'm a Christian. I mean, I go to church, because that's what Christians do. I read my Bible, you know, 
five minutes, a couple days a week, so I can say, check, did it. And, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm doing the thing. I, I put an envelope in the offering plate. And sometimes there's something in it. Um, but, but, I, but I put one in, you know, and I, and I, and I, and I give something. You know, so so now here's what I want you to see. Religion can look like I went to church, I read my Bible, I said a couple prayers, put something in the offering plate, I'm good. And, and, and it, it could be absolutely empty. See, are, are you saying there's people that can show up and go to church and go through all the motions and not really know Jesus? Is that possible? What's the answer? You bet it is. You bet. And, we better, and when we say that, we better check our own hearts and make sure we're not just going through the motions. Now, what might seeking the reality of Jesus look like today? Here's what I want you to notice. It's the same things, but it's different. So, it could look like this. Passion for worship with God's people. I show up at church, to the same church, with the same people, but I walk in with this passion to glorify the living God, with this desire to see the face of Jesus, with this hunger to lift up the glory of God and give him praise, and that is my heart's desire. Two people walk into church for worship, and one person's just going because they have to, and one's going because they want to meet Jesus. It looks the same, but they are worlds apart. You know what I'm saying? So, so to the outward observer, it may look the same. But inside of us, we understand. So, so, so what might seeking the reality of Jesus look like? I am a worshiper. When I gather with God's people, I come for the glory of God. And if I get blessed along the way, that's a bonus. But I'm here to glorify God. I'm here to praise his name and lift him up. It, it looks like a hunger for the word of God where you say, oh God, if you breathe by your Holy Spirit truth into our arid, dry, empty world, then I hunger for this book. And I don't just kind of take a little snack occasionally because that's what Christians are supposed to do. I want to feast on your word because this word carries the truth of the heart of the living God. Both people are opening the Bible and reading it. One person is checking off their list. The other person is longing to meet the God of the universe who has, sp listen, who has spoken into human history. It looks the same to the casual observer, but they're radically different. What might seeking the reality of Jesus look like? I desire to invest in the work of Jesus. So I don't throw an envelope in the offering plate because I'm supposed to. I look at everything I have and I say, God, how do I leverage all that you've put into my care that I might more and more and more invest in what lasts forever? Both people are given something in the offering plate, but one person is throwing off something that doesn't challenge them, doesn't stretch them, and doesn't really mean anything. Another person is saying, what can I do to forward the work of Jesus because this has eternal significance? They look the same, but they're radically different. And one is religion. And it, it, it's, it's a vapor. It, it, it's smoke and mirrors. It's just going through the motions. And one is reality because it's founded in Jesus Christ. And that's what Paul is getting at. He's, he's saying, don't, don't just... Do religious stuff. And I, and I love how the Apostle Paul says this. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. Don't get caught up in religion. Get captured by Jesus. And walk with him and love him and know him. And watch what he does in your life and through your life. Let's continue in the passage. Colossians 2, 18 and 19. It goes on. Do not let anyone who delights in false humility... And the worship of angels disqualify you. I don't want to get into the whole worship of angels, but this is part of, tied into a couple of different religious systems that, at that time. There were these experiences with angels, special spiritual knowledge. Gnosticism had the special spiritual knowledge that you had to have a certain pathway to get to. And there were all these different religions converging. At this time in the church of Colossae, there was at least three different groups of people from different religious backgrounds. There were people that were Gnostic, the certain philosophy that we talked about a couple months ago, that had this certain view of that, that God's word and truth isn't enough. You have to have special revelations and, and, and these different encounters with the, with the divine. And then there were also people who came out of Judaism who were carrying their Jewish legalism into Christianity with them. And then there was other pagan religions who had become Christians, but they were carrying some of their pagan religions. So you have this mishmash of Gnostic thinking, of Judaistic thinking, and of pagan religions. And Christianity had captured their hearts, but in many ways they were bringing their old belief systems in with them. And, and, and Paul is saying... It, it's, it's about Christ. Don't let those things capture you. So somebody says, well, you know, they, 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 they give this, you know, I, I've had these experiences with angels, which puts me above everyone else. There's this pride. And then he says, such a person also goes into great detail about what they have seen. They're kind of their special revelations, their special insights. 
They are puffed up with idle notions by their unspiritual mind. They think they're spiritual. People think they're spiritual because look what they've experienced. But he's saying their mind is not truly spiritual. They have lo- and here's the key. They have lost connection with the head from whom the whole body, supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grows as God causes it to grow. They've lost connection with the head. Jesus Christ is the head of the church. Same problem. What, what the Apostle Paul really does is he cycles through the same problem three times. They're becoming super spiritual and religious, but radically unchristian. And you hold on to Christ because he is the one who holds on to you. He is the one who gives you strength to press forward. So what are you pursuing? Personal pride or Christ-centered humility? What do you pursue in your faith? Is your faith about how I feel about myself and how I look to other people? And we have to be careful of this. Why? Because these books of the Bible are there by the Spirit of God because they're warnings for us in our lives too. And we can't just look back at the ancient world and church and say, oh, how, how, could those, how could those Christians in the first century act that way or live that way? We should say, Lord, make sure I'm not letting that happen within me. And, and so what am I, what, what's driving me? What am I pursuing? Personal pride or Christ-centered humility? What might false humility or pride look like today? I would say it's, it's when you're disconnected from Christ in his church and you're all about me. You might be in the church or there's lots of Christians who say, well, I don't really like the church. I don't really like organized religion. I, I, love, Je- I love Jesus, but I just don't love his church. Somebody comes to me and says, I like you, but I hate your bride. I'm going to say, I don't know if you like me very much because I'm crazy about my wife. And, and there's, there, there's people that kind of, you know, they folk, but, they're, but they're focused. I don't need the body of Christ. I, don't, I, I, I got me and Jesus, Jesus and me. So it becomes this. It becomes about my religious experience, about my giftings, about e- even about my ministry, what I do. It's, it's all about what I do, and it's all about me. But Christ-centered humility, what might Christ-centered humility look like today? And again, it's similar but radically different. Um, it's not just about my religious experience. It's about humbly waiting on Jesus and sitting at his feet. It, it's Mary who comes and just sits at the feet of Jesus. And she's not all about, you know, it's not all about, look, look at my great religious experience. It's about, no, I'm looking, I'm looking at Jesus. I'm focusing on him. And I think sometimes in our churches today, we look and say, you know, I want to go to church so I can have an experience. And how about if we say, I want to gather with God's people so I can glorify Jesus. And here's the beauty of it. When you really get that right, what happens when you truly come to glorify Jesus? You meet him. Can I tell you something? There's no experience like meeting Jesus. There's nothing like meeting Jesus. There's nothing like seeing his face and hearing his voice. There's nothing like feeling the conviction of the Holy Spirit that brings you to repentance. So I want want an experience. You want an experience? Let the Holy Spirit convict you and bring you to your knees. Now you're experiencing Jesus. Right? Some of my most powerful experiences in all my life of faith is when the word of God like a two-edged sword, has cut into my soul and my heart and shown me my, my bitterness and my sinfulness and my pettiness. And God stripped it all, and I finally just humbled myself and fell on my face before Jesus, and I met Jesus in a new way. I want, another, I want just another tingly, you know, buzz experience, another, another religious high. No, no, we, we want to meet Jesus. That's where the substance is. And we, we'll say, Jesus, wherever you take me, if you bring me to my feet to praise you or you bring my knee, to me my, my knees in repentance, I want to meet Jesus. Is that the desire of your heart? Because that, that's what the Apostle Paul is talking about. It's not about my spiritual gifting and, and what I can experience in my own gifting. It's about, it's about being amazed that God would use us for his glory, that God would call us to serve him and to serve the world. It's not even about my ministry. It's about the advancement of God's kingdom. So well, look, look what I can do for Jesus. Well, yes, God calls us to serve him, and that's very biblical. But at the end of the day, we want God glorified. So, so when I serve Jesus, my desire is not to have people say, oh, aren't you wonderful? My desire is for people to say, isn't God good? And if, some, and if somebody leaves church and pats me on the back, and, and, and all they say is, great job, pastor. Wow, you did a great job. Then, then, then I failed. But if somebody comes and says, I feel like I heard from Jesus. I feel like I, I met Jesus in a new way. That, you know, that's why we do what we do. And, and I'm not just talking about as a pastor. I'm talking about as Christians. We want to propel each other into the presence of Jesus. We want to invite other people into the presence of Jesus. And the passage continues in Colossians 2, 20 to 23. 
since you died with Christ to the elemental spiritual forces of this world, why, as though you still belong to the world, do you submit to its rules? What, what, what is Paul saying? He's saying you've come in from these other, un, you know, from, from these other religions and you found the truth in Christ, but you're dragging in these worldly systems and you're laying them on top, you're kind of layering them over Jesus. So you're, you're missing the point. So then he said, then if you notice in your Bible, this is in quotes, this was actually a saying in the church of Colossae. He's quoting them their own saying. Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. No, 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 no. Can't do that, can't do that, can't do that, can't do that. Why? Because that's unreligious. He said, you've got, you become all about rules and regulations. But they're not, they're not God's guidelines, they're your own human ones. And they'd, gotten all, they'd become highly religious and they'd wandered away from Jesus. Verse 22, these rules, which have to do with things that are all destined to perish with you, use, with food, with drink, with the things of this world, are based merely on human commands and teachings. If you have your own Bible, underline that. They're based on merely on human commands and teaching. What is he saying? The rules and regulations we're talking about aren't God's guidelines for life. They aren't God's truth. They aren't God's commands. They are human rules. And you're now obeying human rules and walking away from Jesus. And he's saying, you've missed it. So turn around and repent and come back. Such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom. They seem like wisdom. Why? Because they, their self-imposed worship, their false humility, their harsh treatment of the body, this asceticism, this beating of your own body, when, when God says, I've made you good, and they were treating the body like it was evil. But they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. You, you're, you're beating your bodies, you're going through all these human motions, but it's not giving you any power to actually resist sin. Why? Because the power's found where? In Christ. He's the substance. He's life. He's our hope. And they've gone off the tracks. And for us today, as followers of Jesus Christ, you know, we, we have to ask the question, am I on the right path? Am I, am I, have I become a religious person but forgot about Jesus? So the question again, what might religious rules and regulations look like today? And I want to make one more contrast. It could look like this. Do not eat that. Human rules. You know, a good Christian would never eat that. Well, if you're a Christian, you can't eat meat. There's people that actually, there's Christians that judge other Christians if they eat certain things. Do not buy that. Well, you're a Christian. I, I, I had a pastor come and speak when I was in college. I, I'll never forget it. He said, a Christian cannot own and drive a BMW. <laughs> he was dead serious. I thought, what about a Mercedes? <laughs> what, about a, what about a Volvo? What about a used BMW that I got for $1,500? So they can own a $30,000 Ford truck, but I can't own, order, own a $1,200 BMW yeah, I mean, I'm, going, I'm sitting there, my brain's going, what? what? But, but there, there was this, oh, Christian can't. You can't buy that. Do not watch that. We look at the people, you, you can't watch this or that. And, and that becomes religious rules and regulations. Or the question, what might Christ-centered freedom look like if we're truly free in Christ? And here's, this, and this goes, this, this kind of runs through the New Testament. It might look like this. In my freedom in Christ, I'm free to choose to limit what I eat for the sake of Jesus. I may choose to limit myself from certain things. And by the way, I work at that. I mean, I think many of us as Christians say, I want to care for my body. I want to honor Jesus. Jesus, it's an ongoing battle. But I can choose to limit myself, not because God will love me more, but because I love Jesus. He loves me and I want to honor him so I can choose to limit myself. I can choose to refrain from spending so I can give more to the work of Christ. Someone else can say, oh, you can't buy this or that. You're a Christian. Christians can't live at this or that standard. That's legalism. But in my freedom, I can say, I can choose to limit what I spend because I want to be more generous with Jesus. That's freedom. Freedom says, I choose to limit what I watch so I can grow in holiness. I don't want somebody else coming to me and saying, oh, a good Christian could never watch this. But I want to say before Jesus, I will choose to limit what I watch because I want to be a holy man who stands before a holy God with a mind and a heart that isn't filled with garbage. So I choose every day in the freedom of Christ to limit what I do. There's a difference between me blowing the whistle and saying, you can't, and you saying, I want to honor Jesus, I will. And the Apostle Paul is trying to say, take hold of that. So here's the picture. And I'm going to ask the worship team to kind of begin coming back forward again. I'm going to pray in just a moment. P pull up on the screen this, and we, we're going to have this on our website, because this is, if you, this whole passage, by the time I put the whole thing together, I had this chart on my wall, and I was drawing out all this whole passage, and this is kind of what the picture that came to my mind. 
On the one side is shadow. This is how we don't want to, this is, this is sort of religious emptiness without Jesus in the core of it. And the shadow is religious routine, is the personal pride. I follow rules and regulations, self-made guidelines. It's a self-centered kind of religious observance. It becomes judgmental of others because you're not as spiritual as I am. It's shadowy and unsubstantial, and it's passing away. Read the passage with that in mind, and all of that is in this passage. But on the right, the substance, this is where we want to live, is a reality in Jesus Christ. It's Christ-centered humility. It's freedom in Christ, and in that freedom, I choose to follow him. It's God-established, not man-made. It's Christ-centered, not self-centered. It's freedom to now walk in obedience to Jesus Christ. It is real, solid, substantial, and it is eternal. That's what Jesus wants for you. That's what he wants for me. And that's what the Apostle Paul is calling the church in Colossae to live like this because they had wandered far from it. Lord Jesus, we pray as we continue to worship, as we continue to lift you up, to praise you, to celebrate you, we ask that you would meet with us. Lord, now we get the amazing privilege of actually coming to the table of Jesus Christ to remember your body broken, Jesus, your blood shed. We have the privilege of watching people go into the water of baptism and to remember that they have died to sin and been raised to new life. We have the privilege of singing praise to you. So Lord, meet us in this time.